thank you to Abvi and Lesejo for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm going to be talking about the topic of where are we now? And I'm going to attempt to take you on a whirlwind update through everything HIV and its management. So these are the disclosures and disclaimers from Abvi. And in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about where have we come from? Where are we now? Where are we going? With regards to general HIV, HIV treatment, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission, as well as general HIV prevention. So I'm sure you all realize we could spend a week discussing all of these topics, but for the sake of keeping it in one hour, it's not going to be completely exhaustive but I've chosen the aspects that I think are the most important for all clinicians to know about um, HIV um, in case you've been asleep over the last few years when things have been changing a lot, this will hopefully give you a very quick update. Where have we come from? We've come from a place where HIV was a death sentence. There was no treatment. Over 25 million incredible young people have lost their lives because of this devastating illness and because we had no treatment for it. But now we have excellent treatment and people living with HIV have completely normal life expectancy. Here's a picture of a 100 year old man with HIV who eventually died from old age. People living with HIV these days should not die from HIV. There is no reason for them to die of, from HIV or from AIDS. In one study, they even found that people living with HIV live longer than people without HIV. And that's just because they were on treatment, they were going to their clinic, they were getting tested for high blood pressure, diabetes, etc. So their general health care was better because they were attending um, a clinician or a clinic regularly. So we need everyone to know this, that there's no need for stigma anymore. HIV should not affect one's life as long as they're on treatment. We've even managed to cure some people of HIV. Unfortunately, this wasn't a great cure though, because it meant that um, th these patients were only cured because they had um, cancer, leukemia or lymphoma. They had to undergo chemotherapy which took out, wiped out their immune system. They then had a bone marrow transplant from a patient, from someone with um, the CCR5 mutation, which prevents HIV, the person getting HIV, and they then were cured. Um, so this is very exciting, but it's not a practical cure for, for anyone. That's not a process anyone would want to go through when they could just take a tablet every day and for all intents and purposes, live as if they don't have HIV. But in the future, we do still hope that we get a vaccine, an effective one, um, and an HIV cure. Scientists have been working really hard on this so far. Unfortunately, nothing has been very effective so far, but I still hope that in our lifetime as clinicians, we will see the HIV vaccine or the cure or both being developed. So let's look at HIV treatment. We've come from a place of having no treatment whatsoever. Then we had some ARVs, but the, CD, the side effects were, were not great. So we said only start these ARVs when a patient has a low CD4 count because you had to balance the risks and benefits. Then we realized through the Temprano and the START trials that in fact, it's better for everyone with HIV to be on treatment immediately. This was now when treatment was more accessible, it was cheaper, it had less side effects. So universal test and treat came into practice, meaning we need to find everyone with HIV and get them on treatment. And then same day initiation was found to be the best thing through the rapid trial, which was done in South Africa, um, which, which showed that this is an option. It is a safe option. We don't have to do three weeks of adherence counseling before starting a patient when you can just start them and still do adherence counseling. Um, 
you don't have to wait for that to be done. And then there's less loss to follow up. The patients are then started and you can review them uh, more regularly. And ultimately they had the better retention and care and viral suppression. You obviously do want to delay starting ARBs if you suspect that they might have TB, cryptococcal meningitis, liver derangement, if they just look very ill, like anything, you know, these are, are suspected or possible. Um, and you do want to do your baseline bloods in private. We recommend CD4 viral load, creatinine, ALT, hip B surface antigen, um, and syphilis testing at baseline. That's in the HIV Clinician Society guidelines. And remember to do the serum CRAG if the CD4 count is less than 200. In government practice, this is a reflex test, but not all the labs in private are doing that yet. So please remember if there's a CD4 count less than 200, you must do a CRAG and then work them up for, if it's positive, you want to do a lumbar puncture and check for cryptococcal meningitis before you start them on ARVs. So now, where have we come from? And again, nothing in terms of ARV options. Then we found AZT worked a bit, but patients developed resistance very quickly. So then we realized that giving three drugs at once was much better, triple therapy. And then we found fixed dose combination. So they can take all three drugs in one tablet, makes life much easier than taking multiple tablets twice a day, et cetera. And TEE became our, our first line therapy of choice in about 2013. And this did really well. And patients did really well on it, but um, while patients were doing better, we also did see increasing HIV resistance, particularly to the NNRTIs, especially efavirenz and nevirapine. So we need a second line, which is generally our PI-based regimens, either lapinavirotonavir or atazanavirotonavir or darunavirotonavir. And these have very good um, genetic barriers to resistance. But then we still found that even if patients hadn't yet started ARVs, they were ARV naive, there was still an increasing um, percentage of patients, over 10% of people in, in South Africa were found to have NNRTI resistance even before starting ARVs. So we then moved to our first line um, treatment of choice being TLD in 2019, Tenofovir 3TC Dolutegravir. So why is Dolutegravir so great? It is given once daily, it has few side effects, few drug interactions, it's affordable. And what we care most about when it comes to HIV treatments is that it has a high genetic barrier to resistance. So you can see on this graph here, which plots potency on the, on the y-axis against genetic barrier to resistance on the, the x-axis, you can see that dolutegravir, lapinavirotonavir, and darunavirotonavir have very high potency and very high genetic barrier to resistance. That means that it's very difficult for HIV to develop resistance to these drugs. So they generally can work for a long time. A patient can stay on them for a long time without developing resistance. Whereas drugs like nevirapine, 3TC, emtricitabine, um, they have lower potency, but much lower genetic barrier to resistance. So a patient can take them for just a month. And if they take a dose, miss, take some, miss them again, they can develop resistance very quickly. Even in a month, they can now be resistant already to these drugs. So I'm going to do a few polls. My first poll is, does dolutegravir cause neural tube defects? I'll give you a few seconds to answer. Let's see what you all say. Okay, there's so many of you on this, but you're answering very quickly. It's impressive. Okay, I'm going to end there. Just because I don't want to wait too long. I know some of you are still answering. But that's very interesting. I see almost a third of you say yes, and two thirds of you say no. So let's look at the answer. <laughs> so those of you who said no, 
are correct. So initially, when Dolly Tigrava first came out, there was a signal raised in the Tsapamo study based in Botswana, which initially showed that there was a possible increased risk of neural tube defects. But later on in that study, when the final results came out, it showed that there was in fact no statistically significant increased incidence of neural tube defects on Dolly with, on, with mothers um, or in children of mothers who fell pregnant while on Dolutegravir. And in fact, all the other studies of in all ladies on Dolutegravir anywhere else in the world did not find any increased risk of neural tube defects. So in fact, we do not think that Dolutegravir causes neural tube defects. And we found that Dolutegravir um, causes, uh, well, helps with viral suppression during pregnancy. And it's in fact now recommended that everyone takes Dolutegrava, including women who might fall pregnant or already are pregnant. Dolutegrava is still the best drug for them. And you do not need to worry about the neural tube defects. So I hope for the third of you who are still, um, still didn't know this latest information, I hope you know it now. Okay, the next question I have for you is, does Dolutegrava cause weight gain? interesting one <laughs> it is okay let me in there and share the results so 61 percent of you say yes dolutegravir does cause weight gain and 39 percent of you say no so that is very interesting So I think those of you who said yes, I'm sure you've all seen the results of the advanced trial. You've probably seen this graph presented by Francois Fenter um, many times. Um, this gave us all a bit of a fright because the study was set in South Africa and it showed that particularly black women um, had an increase in weight gain over a two year period when on Dolutegravir. So the green line shows patients on um, Tenofovir, FTC, and Efavirenz, and they gained on average three kgs over two years. Blue line is for TLB, and they gained on average five kgs. The red line is for those who were on TAF, FTC, Dolutegravir, and they gained on average 10 kgs over a, ten year, over, over a two-year period. So this was quite worrying. Um, but in fact, since then, so this made us think, oh, Dolutegravir causes weight gain and TAF in particular. But since then, they've done a relook at these same patients from the advanced trial. And they categorize them by how they um, metabolize efavirenz. So that's th through this mutation here, this gene here, the CYP2B6 is how they metabolize efavirenz. So um, the blue line here um, represents those who are on dolutegravir, so TLD, and their weight gain. Um, and then the orange line is those who had, ex these are all the orange, yellow, and green lines are those who are on efavirenz, but the orange line is those who had extensive metabolism of efavirenz. Now, this means that they metabolize it quickly. And you can see these people actually gained more weight than those with dolutegravir. This is again in females. So the extensive efavirenz metabolizers had similar or more weight gain than those on dolutegravir. Whereas the yellow line is those with intermediate um, efavirenz metabolism and the green line is slow efavirenz metabolism. And those patients both had less weight gain than those on dolutegravir. So if they are metabolizing efavirenz slowly, it means the efavirenz builds up in their system to higher concentrations, and they can actually get efavirenz toxicity. So what this graph is showing is that it's not dolutegravir causing the weight gain, because then why 
those people who who metabolize efavirenz quickly and well and get it out of their system and don't build up toxic levels, they gain more weight. So in fact, it's not dolutegravir causing weight gain. It's it's more like an efavirenz toxicity or high concentrations of efavirenz, efavirenz, which is preventing weight gain. So I hope that has um, cleared some of some of your thoughts up. Let's go to the next poll. This one is HIV treatment should always involve three ARVs. True or false? Okay, I'm going to end it there. You guys are quite quick at answering. <laughs> so, 71% of you say yes. HIV treatment should always involve three ARVs. And 29% of you say no. So this is also very interesting. Um, and this one, I must, let me not give you the answer. I'll tell you now. Okay, so I've got another poll first before I'm going to ask you, uh, before I'm going to answer, because then I'll explain it all. The next poll question is, can you switch from TEE to TLD if a patient has a high viral load? Okay, I don't know if it maybe didn't come out in that topic, but it's can you switch from TEE to TLD if a patient has a high viral load. This one will always challenge us, the old school <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> okay, let me end there and share. Okay, so this one was closer, but 56 of you, 56% said yes, in fact, and 44% said no, but we can see that we're quite a divided audience. Sure, over 500 of you already. That's impressive. Okay, so now let me answer these questions. So in terms of switching regimens, where have we come from? We've come from a place where we had the mantra, never switch one drug in a failing regimen i.e. you need two fully active new ARVs if you're going to switch. So um, 3TC and Emtricitabine, we use kind of interchangeably and we recycle that from one regimen to the next. So that one is quite a staple, whether you're in first line or second line or third. But we've always said you need to change two drugs. So if someone fails TEE, you then have to change them to say AZT, 3TC, and Dolutegravir. So the AZT and, and Dolutegravir are brand new, fully active drugs with no resistance. Then we found the Ernest study, which showed that you can switch to a PI. Um, in the study, it was lipinavirotonavir, and you can recycle two resistant NRTIs. So say you switch from a failing TEE to still turn off of a 3TC and lipinavirotonava, and the patients did well. They still managed to suppress their viral load just as well as if um, you know, they, were, they were new ARBs. So that was very interesting, and that was the first time we saw that our mantra had a little flaw in it, or not a flaw, it's a good flaw. It's, it's, something, it's a, something that this, these PIs are working well enough that you can have two resistant NRTIs and the, the regimen will still work. But keep in mind that if you don't have those, in, those NRTIs, if you just gave the PI by itself, it doesn't work as well. So you do need the NRTIs there, even though there's some resistance mutations. Then dolutegravir came along, and we didn't know, will this apply to dolutegravir as well? So that UNA study was mainly with lipinavirotonavir, but we assume it's the same with atazanavirotonavir and darunavirotonavir. But now 
Dolutegravir is a whole new class of ARVs. It's the INSTEs. Will the same thing apply? So until we had the answers, we have been saying that you have to change. If someone fails TEE, they have to change to AZT3TC Dolutegravir because we, we didn't know if you had to have you know, a new ARV or not. But the Nadia study has now given us the answer to that question. This is quite recent um, results. And it shows that you can switch dilute to dilutegravir and recycle two resistant NRTIs being tenofovir and either imtricitabine or lamivudine, either one. So in the Nadia trial, they took patients failing TEE they changed some of them to AZT3TC dolutegravir, as we have been doing in our guidelines. Um, and then they changed the other half of the patients to TLD. So they maintained the tenofovir lamivudine with the dolutegravir. And they, in fact, found that those changing to TLD did better virologically than those changing to AZT3TC dolutegravir. So that was a very interesting finding. And we also found more resistance developed in those on, a, on AZT rather than on TLD, even though the tenofovir, um, you know, most likely there was resistance already. So that has changed the way we see things now. We don't know, however, if Nadia applies to a Abacava or AZT. So we only know that it applies to tenofovir because that's how it was studied. So we don't want to try it in these other drugs until we know, but I think there is some um, studies with results coming out quite soon. So hopefully then we'll see if it works with Abacava as well. Then we had some other very interesting new studies which showed that dual therapy can work. So we've been saying three drugs all the time, you know, for, for so long. And now we're finding that, oh, actually two drugs can work. It was specifically dolutegravir and 3TC um, that the one study was done and the other one was dolutegravir and rilpivirine. And they found that this can work as long as, as the, the dolutegravir, there's no resistance to dolutegravir and the other drug, there also must be no resistance. So the 3TC must have no resistance to it. We don't know if dolutegravir can be given with a partially active 3TC. So if there's some resistance to 3TC, we don't know if this will work. We do know that dolutegravir alone does not work. That was shown very clearly in the Domino and Mon case study. So you should never, ever do that. Never give dolutegravir alone. The patients, after 24 weeks, they looked like they were doing well. But after 48 weeks, they were getting high viral loads and developing resistance. So do not ever try that. So because of this exciting new evidence that came out, particularly from the Nadia study and two other studies as well, which sort of corroborated that um, those results, we published this HIV Clinician Society update. Um, myself and Jeremy Nell and Francois Fenter and Leon Levine, who's on, on the panel now, uh, together we wrote this and it was released um, because the new guidelines are in process but they might take a while still. So we wanted to get this information out quickly so that clinicians can act on it already. So this gives that update um, that you can switch from TEE to TLD with a high viral load, and that's better for the patient than changing them to AZT3TC dolutegravir. So for treatment optimization now, patients on TEE can and should change to TLD regardless of their viral load. If it's suppressed, change them. If it's high, change them. Patients on PI-based regimens can also change to TLD, but their viral load must be suppressed. We'll see what comes out in the guidelines. This is still up, up in debate a bit, but for now it's safe if the viral load is suppressed to make this change. In patients who have renal failure and can't be on tenofovir, so they aren't either Abacava or AZT, 3TC and Efavirenz, they can also change to Dolutegravir um, with Abacava or AZT, so keeping whichever one they had, 
but the viral load should be suppressed. Because remember, I said so far, we do not have any evidence whether the Nadia applies to Bacava or, or AZT. But hopefully evidence will come out soon. But for now, do not change these patients unless they have a viral load um, that is suppressed. And the same thing for children who are usually on a back of a 3TC and either favarins or lapinavaritonava. If they are between 20 kgs to 35 kgs, um, sometimes even a bit lower than 20 kgs, we can give dolutegravir, um, but they can switch to dolutegravir with the back of a only if the viral load is suppressed. Again, let's wait and see that there's evidence it works before we do it. We don't want to cause any resistance in anyone, particularly in children. So as I said, the HIV Clinician Society guidelines are in the process of being updated. So it's very exciting. Um, maybe they'll be out later this year, maybe early next year. Same thing with our national consolidated guidelines. They're also in the process of being updated. So keep your eyes and ears open for, for both of these. In dual therapy, to just go into a bit more um, detail on this, for initiating dual therapy, only option you can use so far is dolutegravir 3TC. That's the only one that's been studied so far um, as a, for ARV naive patients who are initiated on therapy. And it was found to be non-inferior to three drug regimens at least to three years. Beyond that, we don't know, but the studies were, were done for three years and it was non-inferior. Um, it had, that was virologically, the suppression was pretty much the same as with the three drug regimen. Um, and it had similar safety profile with a small renal advantage. So because the, the three drug regimens generally had tenofovir, whereas in this case, you don't have the tenofovir, it's slightly safer, slightly less renal complications that were shown in the Gemini 1 and 2 trials. But you have to be careful who you give this regimen to. This is not just for, for anyone. The trials were only done on certain patients, so you can only give this to certain patients. Their viral load must be less than 500,000. Their CD4 count must be over 200. This was in the study, they actually did include patients with lower CD4s and it was found that it didn't work as well. Those patients didn't have good outcomes. So you do need a CD4 count to be over 200. They can't have hepatitis B because then they need the tenofovir to treat the hepatitis B. They can't have TB because we don't know um, when someone's on TLD, we add extra dolutegravir and it works with TB treatment. With this dual regimen, we don't know if it's the same thing. We don't know if it will work as well yet. Maybe evidence will come out later. We don't know yet. Um, and then importantly, it must be a true initiation. It can't be a reinitiation. So many patients might come to you and say they've just tested for HIV and now they need treatment. Or they come to you and you test and then they start treatment. They say they've never had any before. Whereas in fact we are finding that many of those patients actually have been on treatment before. And either they don't want to tell you that they defaulted and you're going to shout at them or be cross or something, or they are maybe with a new partner and they want to pretend that this is a new diagnosis, that you know the, the couple are testing together. So for, for whatever reason, they might not tell you that they had treatment before. And if they had any treatment before, they very likely have 3TC resistance because it's so easy to get 3TC resistance if they were on treatment, didn't take it perfectly, defaulted or whatever. So you have to make sure that they definitely did not have any treatment before if you want to give this dual therapy. And it ideally also should be a patient who you don't have adherence concerns about because, you know, it worked well, as I said, it was non-inferior in the trials we, for three years. We don't really know after that, and we don't really know in the sort of practical everyday life, maybe if patients aren't taking their treatment as well, not following up as well, maybe they won't do as well. We don't know. Maybe it'll be the same. Um, but yeah, in the, in the HIV Clinician Society guidelines that are out at the moment, they are more saying only use this if there is 
you know, a reason to not give a third drug. So say there's renal impairment and anemia and you don't want to give um, those regimens or um, something like that. Um, but otherwise you can do it, but just monitor them well. Then when can you switch to a dual therapy? So you can do this. Um, if patients are on first line therapies and they are virally suppressed and they have never had virological failure. So it's not good enough to say, oh, well, they suppressed now. You need to check every viral load they've ever had and it needs to have been suppressed the entire time. Then you can switch them to dual therapy potentially. And your options now are a bit more. There's been some more studies. So it can either be the 3TC Dolutegravir combination that was shown to work in the Tango and Salsa trials, also up to Tango was also up to three years. Um, it was non-inferior, so that's a good option. Or Rilpivirine Dolutegravir, which was done in the SWORD 1 and 2 trials. Um, that is the 3TC Dolutegravir, there is a fixed dose combination that's out at the moment. Um, Rilpivirine Dolutegravir fixed dose combination will be coming soon. Um, and then cabotegravir rilpivirine is another option, which I'll talk about in a second. So you can do this if this is going to potentially help with side effects. Um, there was some increased side effects seen in the trials. So this is because they were taking patients who were on a first line regimen, they were suppressed. They'd always been suppressed. So therefore they weren't having side effects most likely. You know, they'd either had side effects and moved onto a different regimen or they had overcome their side effects and they were now happy on their regimen. So to now take some, take a whole lot of people who are happy on their regimens without any side effects, move them to a new regimen, there is a chance of some new side effects developing. These are all very well tolerated regimens, but just that change can cause some, some new side effects. Most of them were very mild, um, but it's just to note if you are ever switching someone from one regimen to another, you can tell them this new regimen might be better for you, but just be aware you might develop some new side effects. You can just come in and let me know if you don't like them. Most of the time they get better by themselves and it's not an issue. This switch to dual therapy is contraindicated in anyone with hepatitis B. Again, they need their tenofovir to help them with their hepatitis B. Anyone with TB, you can't do this. Rilpivirine can't be given with TB treatment at all. Um, and there are key drug interactions with rilpivirine. So you must just be aware of those before you, you give rilpivirine ever, um, particularly PPIs have interactions. Rilpivirine must also be given with food. And the patients, again, should be adherent because in the trials, they were quite adherent. So ideally, you want them to be adherent. Um, on their, their dual therapy. Otherwise, maybe keeping on a, a triple therapy might be slightly more robust. We don't really know. Okay, so that's where we are now. Well, some of those are still coming, but where are we going in the future? So I think this is probably the most exciting thing that I'll tell you today is the injectables. Cabotegravir and rilpivirine can be given as two injections every two months. This was shown in FLARE, ATLAS, and ATLAS two-month studies, and the patients did really well. In fact, they often you know, did better because adherence was not an issue anymore. They just have to take injections once every two months rather than tablets every day, so no tablets. Um, to do this, they must be virologically suppressed on the other regimen. So rilpivirine in particular does not do well if a patient's viral load is over 100,000. So whenever you're giving it, um, whether it's orally or as the injection, you want the viral load to be lo as low as possible before. So in this case, you want them to be suppressed. And again, they must have no history of virological failure. You don't want any cabotegravir resistance, which is very similar to dolutegravir, by the way. So if there's any dolutegravir resistance, they will likely have cabotegravir re resistance. And you don't want any rilpivirine resistance, which is very similar to efavirenz, also an NNRTI. So if they've ever had efavirenz before, any chance they've failed that, then you don't want to give rilpivirine um, if they've got resistance. So in the studies, patients did really well virologically, and they didn't have many side effects. They did have 
quite a lot of injection site reactions. But interestingly enough, 91% of them preferred the long-acting injections over they didn't care about the injection site reactions or the pain on injections. They were just happy to not have to take tablets um, ever again. So all the patients who were given the injections, they wanted to stay on that. And the patients who were randomized to get the oral tablets, they all wanted to change to the injections. So I think this is really exciting. I think a lot of patients will really benefit from this um, the trials are, it's not yet registered in South Africa, but there are trials happening in South Africa to figure out how it works practically, how it works on our populations, and see how we can maybe roll this out in our country. So hopefully coming soon. In other long-acting ARV options, um, just these are still in the pipeline, but just to get your hopes up, leave you feeling a bit happy about, about the future, um, is Latrivia is an NRTTI, and it's a very small tablet that can be taken daily or weekly or even monthly. So imagine just one little small tablet once a month. Also fantastic. The trials on this were put on hold, but they've all started again. So hopefully we'll see some good results um, with this drug in the future. And then another drug, Lenacapivir, is a capsid inhibitor. And this can be given as a six monthly subcutaneous injection. So that's also an exciting option. Imagine just having to come every six months for a little subcut injection. Obviously, these both need to be given with other ARVs. So we still have to figure out which are the best ones to give them with. But again, exciting things to look forward to. In pediatric formulations, so I'm sure you all know for ages we were using the 2013. Um, pediatric dosing chart. Finally, we have, and, and it didn't change because our formulations didn't change, but finally we have got some new formulations. So we have got a new dosing chart. So please make sure if you're treating any patients, any children with HIV, that you use the 2021 dosing chart. And it's got everything you need to know on it. There will be a new one coming out with the, the new guidelines as well when that comes out. So the um, exciting new formulations that we've got at the moment is the Ritonova powder. Um, before we had to use the Ritonova syrup, which wasn't well um, tolerated and had a very short half-life. So this we use when a child is on Lipinava Ritonova syrup and they have TB treatment with rifampicin. And because of the drug interaction, you have to super boost the child with Ritonova. Um, so Ritonova powder is the best option for this now. You know, with adults, we double the dose of Lipinaba Ritonova, but with children, you have to super boost with Ritonova if they are still on syrups. In pediatric Lipinaba Ritonova tablets, I'm sure you all know about those. Those have been around for a while, but are great because they are smaller in size than adult tablets. And it's good to get the children onto tablets as soon as possible because they all hate the syrup. The syrup doesn't have a great taste, so the tablets are much better. And you can teach children to swallow tablets from age four, even four or five years old. They can learn. They're amazing, often better than I am. Um, Lapinava Ritonava pellets is another option. It comes in a capsule. You open the capsule and it's like tiny mini little tablets inside that capsule, which you have to sprinkle onto a spoon of soft porridge or yogurt or something and then give it to the child. And those pellets don't have a taste if they swallow it uh, quite quickly. If they chew on them, then that horrible taste comes through. Um, but that is another option. It has to be given very well, though. You can't just let the mom put it into a whole bowl of porridge because we know the child isn't going to eat the whole bowl of porridge. The back of a 3TC dispersible tablets are now available in government sector. They've been available in private for a while. Um, they are much better for the children, two-in-one and dispersable, so much easier. Um, and the dosing is all on that pediatric dosing chart. And then what's coming soon and is very exciting is the pediatric dolutegravir, which will also come in um, dispersable tablets and it, can, um, it has a nice taste for the children. Um, and this will be, a, you'll be able to put children on dolutegravir from four weeks of age. So that'll be amazing. Um, and then also an exciting one is the four in one with a Abacava, 3TC and Lipinava Ritonava all in one. 
it also comes in a capsule and it's it's granules but it looks like a powder to be honest it's such fine little granules that it's basically like a powder and again you can the child can eat the powder or you can put it in some water or milk or anything and it tastes delicious it tastes like sweet um, strawberry flavor so that's a great one as well to look out for coming soon to government and private both of these formulations and another new thing is just our new national TB screening protocol. So we've realized that just doing the symptom screening isn't enough. There are new, better technologies we can use to find people with TB. We are missing a lot of TB diagnoses and people with HIV, this is how they die. Most often is still through TB. Our, our mortality from TB is extremely high still. So people living with HIV should have a symptom screen at every visit. And this is regardless of CD4 count. Even when their CD4 count is good, they can still get TB. Anyone can still get TB. Um, but particularly, obviously, when their CD4 count is low, you must be very, very concerned about it. And I often feel like when CD4 counts are below 100, it's, it's TB until proven otherwise. And even one negative test does not prove to me that they don't have TB. They often still do. So you have to dig for it. Urine LAM is a fantastic tool. I hope you all know about it and use it. Um, it's a point of care um, tool that so can be done on the spot. You could even keep some in your, in your practice. Um, if the CD4 count is less than 200, or the patient is sick or has any danger signs with, T, with you know, possible TB symptoms, do a urine lamb and you can find out very quickly that they have TB and start them on treatment. Then Gene Expert is obviously still our fantastic TB screening tool, um, but we need to use it more often than what we're doing. So the new guidance says that people living with HIV should all have a Gene Expert at the time of HIV diagnosis, all of them, and annually. After that, so every year, people living with HIV should have a gene expert. Also, if they fall pregnant, they should immediately have a gene expert. So any pregnant lady with HIV must have a gene expert. Because if they do have TB, you would rather treat that TB than let it pass on to the child. Then in the general population, if they have any TB symptoms or chest x-ray changes, do your gene expert. Any household contacts of people diagnosed with TB, we used to just screen them symptom for symptoms. Now we say do a gene expert. And people tre treated for um, TB previously should now have a gene expert annually for two years because there is still a higher chance that they get TB again, that it comes back. Okay, now moving on to HIV prevention. So PMTCT is such a success story. It's a great one to talk about because we came from a place where mothers with HIV had 40% chance of giving their babies HIV. I remember having those debates. Oh, if you had HIV, would you have a child? You know, it felt like you shouldn't have a child if you have HIV. But now with treatment, we've done so well in South Africa, less than 2% of our babies get HIV from from mothers with HIV. So it's a really great success story and we hope to decrease that even more. And we can do this by planning pregnancies. Anyone with HIV, anyone really, should plan their pregnancies and make sure they have a suppressed viral load before they fall pregnant. We should give PrEP to HIV negative pregnant or breastfeeding women because unfortunately we've actually seen that pregnant women and breastfeeding women have a higher chance of becoming HIV positive than other women. Um, and we know that if they get HIV while they're pregnant or while they're breastfeeding, they get sky high viral loads and it's a very high chance of their baby getting HIV. So give PrEP to these any woman who might have any potential exposure during pregnancy or breastfeeding, rather get them onto PrEP. We know that Tenofovir 3TC has been, you know, used in many, many women who have given birth. We have not seen any negative outcomes from that. Do HIV tests regularly through pregnancy. And I think this is very poorly done in the government sector. 
uh, pregnant patients don't even get offered a test at all. And they really should. In our government sector, there we are very good at testing all our pregnant women. It should just be a routine test. Just routine test for pregnancy is an HIV test. And then if there's any potential exposure, do it three to six monthly throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding. Ensure that they um, have good ART adherence. They start ARVs immediately. They have good adherence and viral suppression. So you want to do viral load at booking, at delivery, and six monthly during breastfeeding as well. And you also want to diagnose infants early. So you do a birth PCR, a 10-week, a six-month PCR. And in the government sector, we do an 18-month universal rapid test. So every single baby at 18 months gets tested for HIV using a rapid test. Um, so again, think about it. I know you might think most of your babies don't have HIV, but if you do the test unnecessarily, you might it might have no effect in most babies, but if you find one with HIV, you are saving a life. An infant prophylaxis. So if there are no risk, so the mother's viral load is suppressed, then you can give nevirapine for six weeks. This is in our national guidelines as well. But if you're in private and the, the mother's not breastfeeding, then you can give AZT instead of the nevirapine. But if they are breastfeeding, then nevirapine is better because nevirapine has been shown to help uh, prevent mother-to-child transmission in breastfeeding women, whereas AZT hasn't. If they are high risk, then you would give the AZT um, for six weeks and nevirapine for 12 weeks. That's in our national guidelines. Um, in private, you could even consider triple therapy if you'd like, um, just to cover even more. Um, but you can always discuss that. I'll give you our helpline number at the end and you can always call and discuss that. And then we've always been so far giving cotrimoxazole to babies from six weeks old. If they're HIV positive, you definitely give it. Um, we were even giving the HIV exposed infants cotrimoxazole. But there has been some new evidence now to show that um, the risks might outweigh the benefits for that. So um, it's not necessarily recommended to give cotrimoxazole to infants that don't have HIV, that are just HIV exposed. You want to only give it if they do have HIV. So look out for that. There might be some changes in the guidelines coming up. Okay, now HIV general prevention. Where have we come from? We've come from, do you remember, the ABC? Abstain, be faithful, and uh, condomize. Not compromise. Um, that was all we had at the beginning. No other options. Now we have many very good options. Free is fantastic. Nafiva, FTC, or 3TC, oral daily tablets is 95 to 99% effective if it's taken correctly. I mean, that's amazing. It should be given daily for at least seven days before any sexual intercourse and for at least 28 days after. It can be cycled on and off. If people are at risk, then they can use it. When they are not at risk or potential exposure is the correct terminology, please forgive me. Um, when they are not having any potential exposures anymore, they can stop it. Um, and it can be given and should be given in pregnancy and breastfeeding. As I said, we know that it's, it's safe um, and it's definitely worth rather pr pr protecting those um, babies. Don't give PrEP if the creatinine clearance is less than 50, if the weight is less than 35 kgs, or if there's any suspicion that they are HIV positive, if they have any symptoms, any viral or seroconversion symptoms, don't give them the PrEP right then, rather wait for the window period, test. Um, or if they are refusing a test, they rather need to be counseled that they do need to test for HIV before starting PrEP, because you don't want to give, if you give PrEP when they already have HIV, um, or if they're busy seroconverting, then it can lead to resistance. If you give PrEP to someone who doesn't have HIV, it can't lead to resistance. Um, On-demand PrEP is a new thing. So they've done these um, trials on MSM, so men who have sex with men and transgender women. 
um, on a regimen that's 2-1-1. So that means you can take two tablets of the Tenofovir FTC um, or 3TC, uh, two to 24 hours before having sex, followed by two days of one tablet each. So this means that someone can literally decide two hours before they're going to have sex. Oh, I think I'm going to have sex tonight. Let me take two tablets quickly. Then wait the two hours. Then if they don't have sex, they don't need to do anything. If they do, the next day they take another tablet and the next day they take another tablet. So I think that's fantastic, makes things much easier. Um, but unfortunately, this has only so far been studied in MSM and transgender women but definitely use it for that population. Um, you can tell them that it might still be safer to take it daily, um, but if they are unlikely to take it daily, then this is definitely better than nothing. This is, it's a, is a good regimen, but taking it daily might be slightly better. Um, we don't yet know in heterosexual men if it works as well or not. Uh, hopefully it does, but for now we aren't prescribing it for them unless they are refusing to take daily and you know this is maybe the the best they can do then why not try it better than nothing um but in women it we don't think it'll work because we know that it takes longer at least seven days to build up the right concentrations of the tenofovir ftc in the female genitalia so we we don't think that this will work for women and then if taf which is taf and um Emtricitabine can also be used daily in MSM and transgender women, um, as seen in the DISCOVER trial, and that just can decrease some of the renal um, risks that TDF can give. TAF has been found to be slightly safer renally than TDF, otherwise it's pretty much the same. And then another exciting one is that cabotegravir I was talking about that can be given for treatment with rilpivirine as injections. You can also use cabotegravir as PrEP. And so it's just one injection every two months. And that has been shown to be extremely um, effective, even more effective than the oral tablets. And that's also likely just because they don't have to adhere to tablets. They can just get this injection once every two months. Incredible, um, very good prevention for HIV. So that's a, another very exciting one to look forward to as soon as it's allowed in South Africa. Then the depivirine ring, they've been doing trials on for quite a while. It's only been found to be about 30% effective. So I don't think this is extremely useful, but it can be useful in situations where perhaps a lady is not empowered or cannot take oral tablets, perhaps who boyfriend or husband is going to beat her up if, she, if they see her taking tablets every day. So this is something that she can do uh, more privately and without taking tablets every day. It's better than nothing, although it's not, it's definitely not 100% um, effective. Next poll, let's do one more poll, is which ARVs would you give for post-exposure prophylaxis? Let's see what you all think. See if you're all still awake. We are here, Doc. <laughs> That's good. Okay, let me end it there. Won't quite get to all 576 of you, um, but here are the results. So 70% of you say TLD, and then the rest of you are a bit undecided amongst the other options. Um, so the majority of you in this, this poll were correct. TLD is definitely the best option for um, Post-exposure prophylaxis, it's, it's a lovely one, one tablet daily. There's very little um, dolutegravir resistance out there compared to the favarins where there is um, quite a lot of resistance to a favarin. So you, you wouldn't want to take a drug that you know might have resistance already. So TLD is definitely the best. The dual therapy regimens haven't been tested in this scenario. Um, and you know if you're trying to prevent 
prevent yourself from getting HIV, you know, why not go for three drugs over two just might be better. Um, so TLD is still the best option for that. Um, in adults anyway, in children, um, you'd have a different regimen. Um, you want to take them every day for a month. And what's important is you must start it as soon as possible after the exposure, preferably within the hour and not later than 72 hours. Um, in studies, it, it doesn't look like it helps. After 72 hours, it doesn't look like it does anything. Um, although we don't have direct studies in PEP because it's not something you can really um, you know, experiment on. But if someone um, you know, only presents after 72 hours um, and they are scared of the risk, you, know, you can counsel them. They could still take PEP if they want to, but they need to know that um, it's very likely it's not going to help. But if they still want to take it, they can. Um, the risk might outweigh the benefit, but you know, sometimes for people's sanity, they would rather just take it. Um, but please try and advise people the sooner the better they get onto that PEP definitely helps. And then you want to do your baseline tests as well, um, follow the, the guidance on how to manage uh, patients who have been exposed, patients or clinicians or yourself. And male medical circumcision is still a good prevention um, technique as it reduces risk of six by 60%. So, I mean, imagine if, if most of our male population can be circ circumcised, that will have a significant impact in our HIV transmission. And then U equals U. I think this is also one of the most exciting findings in recent years in the HIV arena. Undetectable equals untransmittable. So this means that anyone who is living with HIV who has an undetectable viral load will not transmit HIV to their partners. This has been found to be true for sexual partners as well as people who inject, inject drugs. So this is fantastic. It's actually such a game changer. It really can improve the quality of life for people living with HIV. Remember I was talking about, you know, the, the, the debates for people living with HIV thinking, now, maybe they shouldn't have sexual partners. Maybe they shouldn't have children. Now we know they can. They can safely have sexual partners. They can safely have children. Their life is not over. They can live a completely normal, healthy life. And partly because of you equals you, as long as they are on treatment and have a suppressed viral load. This can drastically decrease stigma. So we need to get this message out to everyone, HIV positive and negative, everyone needs to know this. We found in studies that just knowing this message helps to increase people for testing for HIV, particularly in men. So I think this must be, this is me guessing, but it must be because men are thinking, oh dear, if I test for HIV and I test positive, then it's gonna mean I can't have sex anymore. But now they hear this message, they realize, oh, actually, I can. I just need to get onto treatment. And, you know, there is, a, there is a way out here. So it increases the uptake of HIV testing if people know this message. It also drastically improves adherence and viral suppression when people have a goal to strive for. They're on treatment and they know if I get my viral load suppressed, I won't transmit HIV to my partners. I obviously have much less chance of transmitting to a child. And obviously you'll live a much longer, healthier life. You won't get opportunistic infections and you'll never get AIDS. I love telling people that we can guarantee, there's not much you can guarantee in medicine, but this is one thing you can guarantee for your patients. They will never get AIDS if they take their treatment every day and maintain a, vi a suppressed viral load. Then treatment as prevention. This is a fantastic concept. And this has led us to the 90-90-90 goals that you all would have heard of that are now the 95-95-95 goals. Um, they were the United Nations goals for the whole world. Um, and what it means is that 95% of people living with HIV need to know their status. 95% of them need to be on ARVs and 95% of them must have a suppressed viral load. And if we achieve this, 
people will not get sick or die from AIDS. We will reduce mother to child transmission so we won't have babies born with HIV. We'll prevent new infections. And we can end the HIV epidemic, basically. Even without a cure, we can end the HIV epidemic if we get everyone onto treatment so they stop spreading HIV. So that's really exciting. That's definitely our goal. Where are we at so far in South Africa? So as of July this year, we were at 94, 78, 89. So we're getting there. I mean, we have done really well to get that far, but we still do need to just push on and get, you know, we actually want to get to 100, 100, 100, obviously, ultimately. In females, we're doing really well. In men, we are doing less well. And in children, unfortunately, we are really lagging behind. So we really, we need to find, there are children out there living with HIV and they won't live very long. They will die from HIV. We need to find those children. We need to test them. We need to get them onto treatment and we need to get them onto the best treatment and get their viral load suppressed. We really should not have any children dying from HIV. So what do we need to do to try and achieve these 95, 95, 95 goals? So our first 95, we need to offer testing to all patients. And now I know this isn't very well done. And I think people feel um, embarrassed to have that awkward conversation. They feel like they're judging the patient or the patient won't like it if they offer an HIV test. But please just figure out how to do it in a in a polite routine way that's not awkward that's not judging that's just saying these are routine tests you know let's be healthcare providers who want to screen and test and prevent illness as well we don't want to just treat them for what they're coming to us with that's just putting out fires we want to do pap smears we want to do prostate exams breast exams you know give contraception we want to do everything that will help our patients live healthy lives to the best of their ability. Do a blood pressure, do a glucose, do an HIV test. Let's screen for things that are easily treated and just tell patients these are routine tests. Um, I've unfortunately, you can see I'm very passionate about this because I've unfortunately witnessed a good friend of mine whose sister became ill uh, progressively more and more ill, went from GP to GP to GP and was worked up for all sorts of things. No one could figure out what was wrong with her um, and no one did an HIV test. They all thought, well, she's been married for many years um, to the same husband. She has no other sexual partners. You know, we aren't going to, why would we do an HIV test? Um, so unfortunately, by the time she was actually diagnosed, her CD4 count was three. She uh, was initiated, but she died of TB iris very soon after. Um, and that was devastating. And so, yes, it might be some awkward conversations, but just rather save lives. You know, I think it's criminal that that she wasn't picked up and treated earlier. So that's my little um, standing on my soapbox for two seconds. Index testing can also really help us to find the people who have HIV. So every patient you have who has HIV, make sure their children have been tested. Make sure their sexual partners have been tested. Um, they should at least be offered testing. In, in government sector, we've got great programs where we have teams of people who will, you can write down your sexual partners names and addresses and it can be completely anonymous we won't relate it to you at all but we will go to their house and just tr uh, test everyone in the street and say we are doing routine testing for everyone in the street so it's completely anonymous no one's to blame but at least the people are found and tested and can be started on treatment hiv self-screening is also an option these days um, definitely in government sector and it is supposedly available in private but I don't know if the pharmacies always have stock, but, but look for that. It's a nice option for people. They can do in the privacy of their own homes if they would like to just screen themselves for HIV. Um, in the second 95 is getting patients onto treatment as soon as they are diagnosed. 
So remember universal test and treat and same day initiation, just get them on as soon as possible. Um, and then for the second and third 90, you need retention in care. There's no point starting them and then them disappearing and defaulting and not coming back. So if you have any patients on ARVs and they don't come back for appointments, don't just leave them. I think we, we don't always have good systems in place, but in our government clinics, we've developed very good systems of tracking and tracing and following up. If someone doesn't come for their appointment when they're due for their appointment, they're given a phone call. Why didn't you come? If they still don't come after we give it three phone calls, if they still don't come, we go to their house and we find them and say, what can we do for you? Why aren't you coming back? Can we help you get your treatment? Um, Multi-month dispensing, trying to give more months supply at a time so patients don't have to go to the pharmacy every month. That can really help. Um, and we even are doing decanting strategies in government sector where people can go to pickup points by near to them. So they don't have to go to the clinic. They don't have to wait in queues. They can have, we have little electronic lockers or we have different systems where they can go and pick up their medicine or from the post office or from a clicks. Um, treatment optimization, remember to get them on the best possible regimen where there's no resistance. It's a robust regimen, i.e. TLD often. Um, if they're failing, you need to switch them to second line. Try to reduce pill burden where you can and reduce the chance of side effects. We have so many good ARVs these days. There is no reason why anyone should be suffering from side effects. They should tell everyone, if you get any side effects, just come in and tell me and you can change them to a new ARV. And then viral load monitoring is so important. Um, in private, in the HIV Clinician Society guidelines, they advocate for three months, six months, 12 months, and then six monthly or 12 monthly to make sure that the viral load stays suppressed. Um, in the government sector, we're doing six months, 12 months, and annually, if it's suppressed. If it's high, you immediately intervene. If it's over 50, you immediately intervene, and you will retest in three months. And then remember, patient education and adherence support are so important. Um, and tell everyone the good news, the good stories, that there's no reason for stigma anymore. Um, you know, everyone can have a completely normal, great life as long as they take the treatment. So useful tools to look out for is the HIV Clinician Society guidelines. The new ones are coming out. Um, and also on their website, they have all of the guidelines, all of their own guidelines, WHO guidelines, National Department of Health guidelines, on everything related to HIV, also TB and crypto and everything. It's a great resource. National guidelines are also coming out, some new ones soon. So keep your eyes out for both of those. This is our TB uh, and HIV helpline number. If you want to call for advice on any patients, you're welcome or any questions you have, you're welcome to call us um, anytime. And then the Liverpool Drug Interaction Checker is just another really useful tool that I use often. It's You can Google it. Um, it's a website or it's a free app you can download because there are interactions, you know, as soon as people are on multiple medicines together. And this is a great tool. So you can just check that there aren't any drug interactions for your patients. Um, so in summary, that was a whirlwind, I know. Um, offer that HIV test, figure out how to do it routinely and often and for every patient if you can. If they are positive, start them on ARVs. If they are negative, offer them PrEP. See if they might think that they are at any potential risk of exposure and give them a strategy to stay negative. If they are already on ARVs, make sure you give them the best possible regimen and ensure that their viral load is less than 50. Education is really important, especially this U equals U message. Please spread that message far and wide. Tell your friends and family at Bry's and whenever you see them, I, I know most of the population do not know half of these good things about HIV these days. So let's try and do our part to reduce stigma. And again, call our helpline if you didn't catch that number. Thank you. So let's all be the generation that will end HIV. And I hope that we, we do that in our, in our lifetimes. Thanks everyone. Super.
<laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Julia. That was a roller coaster, but it's quite empowering even for me. You know, I haven't been in clinical practice for a while, but now I'm I'm super up to date. <laughs> Thanks to you. Maybe before we, we go through the questions, me and Leon, we were trying to clear the QA for you. Uh, I missed some of the key things, but yeah. Um, Dr. Levine, maybe you want to make some commentary, which is also based on some of the questions you have responded to. I'm not sure if there was a common thread. Yeah, and yeah thanks. You no, there, there were some great questions, and the second I worked quite hard, I must say, but your, your talk was great. Thank you. Um, Julia, so we've left a couple of questions that some that were more comments, some that, that we felt, felt needed a bit more of an explanation. There was one thread coming through, and I've, I've got a couple of others that are afterwards at this time. I can just, things that we've answered, but I think mainly more of an explanation. But there's one thread I just want to mention is that people, I think, are getting confused with the 211 prep. They're seeing it as emergency prep. And is it something that you can just do? And remember, it's got to, you've got to, I think, explain to them that it's got to be done at least two hours before and that it's only in the MSM population. And, and um, if you could elaborate on that, I think there's a bit of confusion there. They're thinking that, you know, it's sudden you can quickly go on to this and then how long, what do you do after that? So if you can just explain the two on one prep and then I think maybe go through the, the, the questions which have been answered. And then if there's time, I've got a couple of about four or five that I think maybe need a bit more elaboration. If we did answer, but maybe need a bit more elaboration. We can just maybe just address the two on one. I think it caused a bit of yes. confusion. Okay, sure. So to go through that again, the two on one um, technique means that they have to take two tablets of Tenofovo FTC before having sex. So between 24 hours before and two hours before. So basically, you know, on that day, they must take um, two tablets before. Then once they've had sex, they must take another tablet the next day and another tablet the day after. So this isn't just a post-exposure prophylaxis. It's still pre, but it's, it's a bit of both, actually. It's pre and post. But you do still have to take the, the two tablets beforehand. Hope that clears it up. And yes, it, the study was only done in MSM, men who have sex with men and transgender women. And this is because of how um, the, the concentrations of the Tanaf of the FTC, how they build up quite quickly in the male genitalia, whereas they do not build up that quickly in the female genitalia. So you cannot do this in women. And even heterosexual men, we do not know yet if this works as well for them or not. So we need to wait for those studies before we use it in heterosexual men. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. So, so yes, yes. during your presentation, there was one particular slide where one or two people requested you to repeat a concept. And this was the whole thing around um, TLD recycling. Um, I think the slide which I thought was a great slide, but yeah, maybe if, if you can just re-clarify <laughs> maybe practically how that works out, thanks, yeah. Yes, sure, okay, and this is this is a very important and useful concept to know. So um, the Nadia study basically took patients who were on TEE um, and were failing, so they had high viral loads on TEE, tenofovir, emtricitabine, and efebrins, and they put them, there was another arm that put them on to Darunavir, but I'm not going to talk about that now. They, um, mm. they found that the Darunavir arm and the Dolutegravir arm did equally as well. So, um, so from that aspect, it doesn't matter which, which you use. But particularly for the Dolutegravir, um, they, then they put half the patients on AZT3TC Dolutegravir and half of them were on um, Tenofovir 3TC Dolutegravir or TLD. So in the, the TLD arm, they were recycling Tenofovir and Lamivudine from a failed TEE regimen onto now their TLD regimen. Whereas the AZT3TC are brand new drugs. Well, AZT is new, so it's, there's no resistance. And what they surprisingly mm. found, because they thought that they would find that the patients on AZT would do better, but they actually mm. found the patients on Tenofovir 3TC lamivudine did better. So those going from TEE to TLD did slightly better 
and had less resistance to dolutegravir. So this means that patients who are failing TEE can switch to second line TLD. You're recycling the tenofovir and the limibudine. Um, but as I said, this is only, we only know that this works for tenofovir, not mm. for if they are on a back of a 3TC of favorins, you can't necessarily give them a back of a 3TC dolutegravir. We need to mm. wait for that data to see if it works or not. Um, so I hope that clears <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you've covered it very nicely. Now, maybe going back to you equals to you, someone is, is asking, are you not worried about the old theory around reinfection? You know, um, because maybe most people will end up not using, I mean, not condomizing. Um, are we not worried about that changing or driving behavior in the opposite direction? Yeah. Yeah, so firstly, I I'll, I'll, will still say that we still definitely advocate for condom usage. Um, you know, it can prevent other infections as well. So there is still syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, all those other infections out there that, um, you know, that we must definitely counsel our patients that using condoms is definitely the best, unprotected pregnancies, etc. cetera. Um, mm. But if their viral load is suppressed, if they don't want to use condoms, so for example, they want to have a baby, you've got a serodiscordant couple, they want to have a baby, is it safe to do that? We can answer them, yes, it is, but get your viral load suppressed first, and then you can have unprotected sex while you're trying to conceive, and your partner won't get HIV. Um, obviously, they need to um, remain virologically suppressed. So you can't say, oh, yes, I was virologically suppressed at my test three months ago. You know, mm. you need to know what you are now. So you would need to either trust your partner and know that they are still taking their ARVs every day. Um, or you need to, you know, retest your viral load quite regularly. Um, but you can't say, oh, I was virally suppressed when I did my test six months ago. Therefore, I can have unprotected sex. No, you need to still be unsuppressed at the time. So you have to be okay. taking your ARVs every day. Um, so cool. Yeah. So on the Q&A, I don't want to read the, the question fully. 1823, uh, Anonymous, I think the first, first question on top. He's referring to the, 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 the whole issue around DTG and, and weight gain. Um, maybe if you can read it slowly and then maybe try to see if you are able to um, respond to it. Thanks. Maybe to the audience, I'll read it. He says, if weight yeah. gain ability is linked to one's metabolism of effervorance, why did the biggest weight gain occur in the group that wasn't on um, effervorance? Does that mean if one, if one excessively uh, metabolizes DTG, then they, can, they are predisposed to, to, to weight gain? Um, we left it there. I'm sure Leon will chip in, but I also remember that TEF as well in community had some effect on some of the results, but I don't know what your take is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So to just clarify, so I think this was a little bit muddled, this question. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was the patients who are extensive metabolizers of efavirenz gained less weight, sorry, gained more weight than the patients on dolutegravir. And by okay. extensively metabolizing efavirenz, that means you metabolize it quickly so it gets out of your system quickly. So we're not saying that if you extensively metabolize efavirenz, that causes you to gain weight. We're just saying the lack of, of efavirenz in your body means that the patient basically would have gained weight. So, it's, so we're thinking that it's more just the effect of being on ARVs causes weight gain um, for many different reasons. I think we all know that patients with HIV might have weight loss. Um, and now you're on ARVs, you, your CD4 count improves, you can gain weight. So I think what this data is more showing is that probably anyone on ARVs will gain some weight. But mm -hmm. the people who didn't metabolize efavirenz well, they therefore built up high concentrations of efavirenz in their body to toxic levels that prevented weight gain. So toxic levels of efavirenz 
is the thing that was preventing weight gain. And I think um, there, there's similar theory around the TAF versus TDF that you mentioned, where we initially thought, oh, people on TAF gained much more weight than people on TDF. Um, therefore, TAF causes weight gain. I think what we found is, is more that it looks like tenofova might prevent weight gain to a certain extent. So again, it's, it's the other way around to what we think, um, that those are the theories at the moment. No, trust me, I got you very clear this time around, and I'm hoping the audience as well. Such a complex process, but now I think we get it. Now, you 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 clearly stated that with regards to dual therapy, uh, someone who's got TB and HIV, that would be, you know, and not an ideal patient. But if someone is on dual therapy and they develop um, um, TB, do we just add the third drug? I don't know what the experience is. Uh, how, how does that work? Yeah. Yes, no, exactly. So if they're on dual therapy, say they're on just dolutegravir 3TC, they develop TB, just put them back onto TLD and double dose that dolutegravir. So you'll give TLD, um, you know, say in the morning and dolutegravir 50 milligrams in the evening or the other way around. Until they finish their TB treatment, then maybe wait two weeks and then you can go back to the dual therapy if, if they want to. Mm -hmm. but we always wait thank two you. weeks for the rifampicin to get out of their system superb thanks thanks for that um nom Fundo is asking are there any side effects from um injectables and i guess this is in the context of you know we have already injected so if something happens what do we do i don't know what was the experience uh, in the studies thanks yeah very good question so they actually did the studies first where they were first saying everyone must have lead-in of oral tablets to make sure we look for bad side effects, um, any adverse reactions to the, the medicine. So they were given cabotegrava and rilpivirine as oral tablets for a month mm. before they went on to the injections. Because the injections do stay in your body for a long time, the half-life is very long and they can be found in your body even up to a year, it can still be found. So you wouldn't want bad side effects or, or adverse events if you just get an injection and now you can't get it out of your system. But what they found in the studies was that no one actually had any bad adverse events um, or side effects where it, where it mattered. Um, so the injection side side effects were, were common, but otherwise there was nothing alarming, so, so much so that the FDA has actually approved that you can just start the injections. You don't have to do that month lead in of oral medication. So you can, if when we are allowed, when it's registered in South Africa and it's available, you can counsel your patient and you can tell them they can take oral lead in dose for, for a month if they would like, um, but they don't actually have to. There wasn't any alarming findings. So I hope that helps. Yes, okay. Uh, we'll continue, colleagues, uh, for the next two minutes because half past, we need to try and wrap up. But I think Tabang's question, you have sort of addressed it. Um, he's actually saying, so if he has a patient who has renal failure on, TD, on a TDF-based regimen and uh, this patient is fully suppressed for a while, can he consider treating with two drugs at, from that point onwards without um, TDF? Is that uh, your, the recommendation currently? Yeah. Yeah, so I think either one. So, I mean, currently the recommendation is more to change to a back of her. Um, but mm -hmm. if there's any reason why you don't want to give a back of her, um, then definitely the dual therapy is an option. Um, just make sure, as I've said, the patient must be um, suppressed. They must never have had biological failure before. They mustn't have hepatitis B. They mustn't have TB. Um, and they mustn't be pregnant as well. Um, and then, then yes, the uh, DTG 3TC is an option. Now, uh, Julia, just yeah. on that as well, just to remember, I mean, normally you'd be giving the fixed dose combination, which has got 3TC 150 milligrams. So if the EGFR is below 30, then they can't use the fixed dose. They'd have to use a separate 3TC and reduce the dose to 150 milligrams. But there's obviously there's no reason why they can't do that. Yeah, so that would be the same for, yeah, if they're on the back of a 3TC regimen um, with dolutegravir or with the dual therapy, dolutegravir 3TC, um, same thing. Um, these days, we found that you can continue the normal dose of 3TC 
until the GF, EGFR is 30. If it's below 30, then you need to de start decreasing the dose. So then you'd have to move away from any of the fixed dose combinations. Thanks, Leon. Okay. Urine, lamb, and pediatrics, uh, is it for all kids or there's, uh, there are specific uh, indications in children or, or age groups? That's actually a very good question. And I don't know that I know the answer. Um, Leon, I also do don't know the answer, but I, I asked Dr. Tundi and she's given me the answer. She says it can be used in peas as long as you can collect a fresh sample of urine. Okay, Great. I also didn't know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, so you request to you, uh, 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 Julia, it's back again, and somebody's asking, uh, uh, what about blips? You know, how would someone know if they have a blip, if they believe that they are uh, suppressed? <laughs> What's the risk? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> so um, for those of you who don't know, viral blips are when your, your viral load goes up a bit, so above 50, but still below 1,000. And it can just happen and then come back down again, even with perfect adherence, it can happen. Um, so yeah, we know it can happen. So theoretically, we might think it might be an issue. I think most of those studies that were done on U equals U, um, they actually looked at patients with a viral load under 400, I think. So most of them. So even up to 400, it was safe. And you would think, that if in the, you know, in real life, people can have viral blips that aren't picked up, same thing could have happened in those studies. So for all functional purposes, the people in the studies, not a single um, person got HIV from their partner if their partner's viral load was less than 400 um, at their, their usual visits. So we think that that should translate into, into uh practice, clinical practice. Um, yeah, I obviously can't say 100% is one of those things in, in medicine that I can't guarantee, but yeah. studies have shown that no one got HIV. So um, there were, funnily enough, there were some patients who got HIV um, during that period of time, but they found when they did the genetics of the HIV, they found that it wasn't HIV from that partner. It was obviously mm -hmm. from a different partner. So oh. no one got from the partner who had a suppressed viral load. No one got HIV. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question for, for the night. Uh, 1920 from uh, Gihana. He says, actually, it's just it me. He says, switching AZT, Lamibudin, Lopinavir to TLD. That's all is written. But I think the question is, can we switch can you, from uh, yeah. our traditional second line to TLD? Mm. Yes, so good question. The answer is definitely yes. If the patient is virologically suppressed, then definitely yes, you can do it. So it might be nice because you're moving them from a you know multiple tablets twice a day onto a nice one tablet a day. Um, they might also have less side effects. So I would definitely offer that to my patients with virological suppression. Those with a high viral load, that is a bit of a more difficult question to answer. Um, I would personally, so we're waiting, the guideline committee is all still in debate over this, and we'll wait and see what, what we come out with. But for the moment, I personally would say, if the patient's been on, say, AZT3, TC, Lipinavir, Tonavir for not that long, then they're very, they're very unlikely to have developed resistance to it, because we know Lipinavir, Tonavir takes about two years to develop resistance. Um, and unless they had um, drug interactions like that TB treatment or something at the same time. Um, so if it's been under a year, you know, there's very little chance that they have any lipinavir tonavir resistance. So why not just change them to um, TLD? I would, I would do that without any problem. Um, it just comes to later on, Maybe it might be worth doing a resistance test before switching, just so you know what resistance you're dealing with, because then you'll know if your TLD is now acting as second line or as third line. Um, but that all has to be ironed out by the committee. So <laughs> I'll, I'll say, wait and see what the guidelines say. Super, super. Call the Can helpline if you want case to case um, advice, but we can't give a blanket answer now.
Yes, um, Dr. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Okay, Judy, I think we need to close. You know, I was about to ask yeah. more. Colleagues, if we haven't answered your question, uh, please accept our sincere apologies. Um, Dr. Tena, maybe your closing remarks, and then we close this particular session. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here and for your enthusiasm. And I hope that you um, yeah, treat your patients as best as you can and just call our helpline if you have any questions. Thank you. Super, yeah. super.